Let's okay, let's uh, let's get started. Um, lectures nine, ten, and uh, eleven. We're a little bit behind where I'd like to be at this point in the semester, so I'm going to go relatively quickly through lecture ten, and hopefully we can move on to lecture eleven uh, today. I think a lot of the material in lecture 10 is somewhat obvious. We've spent quite a bit of time now talking about the underlying structure of information spaces and thinking as HCI designers about how to make that structure intuitive to your users to navigate through it. So we've kind of already talked about a lot of the material in 10. So I apologize if it seems to be going by pretty quickly, um, but I want to try and get on to lecture 11 today. Any questions about deliverable 7? Yes. Why do we have the user center? Like, why do we have a step to have them center their hand? Because um, I why why do we have the user like, center their right hand? Right now, like, I have we already built a function that centers it for them. Excellent. Right. So good question. So we already have it built in that if their hand isn't centered, it should still be able <coughs> to recognize the hand. Asking them to center their hand in addition is not so much for the KNN's benefit. You need to think from the user's point of view. Why am I? Why are we asking the users to try and keep their hand more or less centered? I guess so they just don't get confused and have it go out of frame. Exactly right. So if they're if they're concentrating on trying to learn digits and their hand is kind of drifting towards the edge, you know what happens when your hand is near the edge of Leap Motion's field of view, right? So it's just to try and make sure that we're getting as clean frames as possible from the user. So get them in the habit of keeping their hand in more or less one place, right? So it's, it's, it's mainly just a safety precaution. But as you'll see, especially when you start to work with naive users who haven't worked with Leap Motion device, you want to try and put stuff in there that allows Leap Motion to capture as clean a frame as possible. Right? You're all experts now with Leap Motion in ensuring that it captures a clean frame from you, but not from your users. Right? And you don't want to have to get into the nitty gritty details of Leap Motion with your naive users. So we're just going to try and train them to keep their hand near the, near the center. Any other questions about Lecture 7? Yes? I was just, I was just having this, um, a strange issue where the, um, like the image wouldn't load correctly until I terminated program? In, in matplotlib? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so matplotlib was obviously not designed for real-time graphics and for displaying images during real-time and so on, so it can be a little finicky. So for those of you that are trying to read in images and video to matplotlib, as I mentioned last time, it may or may not work. You may want to start up a separate Pygame process which draws the video and then closes when it's when it's done. So I mentioned last time the um, using processes or using pipes in in Python. So it might you might want to go and look at a tutorial there. So you might have your infinite loop, and when it's in a certain state, which is to draw a, an image or a video, you start up or you spawn a separate process running on your machine, and that process or that Python program. Its only job is to draw something to the screen, an image or a video, and when it finishes, that process dies. You can do that sort of thing with, with pipes. In essence, what your main loop is doing is calling or opening a new program and, that, and then just starting it up, and your program will continue. That process will run in parallel, and it'll exit when it's, when it's done. I think that's the easiest way to try and deal with these issues when they come up rather than trying to shoehorn a whole bunch of images and videos into matplotlib. The other option, as I mentioned, is to just uh, <coughs> decamp from uh, matplotlib altogether and do everything in, in PyCam. It's up to you. Any other questions about deliverable 7? No? OK, so uh, back to information spaces. We're still on lecture 9. I promise you we will finish that one today. Okay, so we were again, we were talking about uh, ontologies and you've created this new space that has these new conceptual objects in it. There are particular relationships between these objects. You're trying to help the user navigate through this space. What are the kinds of things that we can, we can do? We ended last time with this issue about what sensor, modal what, what sensor modalities, which of the five senses can be exploited to help the user the, uh, understand the underlying space? Right? So in your case, 
You're doing some 3D graphics because obviously the, the user's hand exists in three-dimensional space. If you remember all the way back to the beginning of the course, we had this little cartoon of a human and an interactive system. The human pushes against the interactive system. They do something and they see something happen in response, right? They see or they hear a response. What sorts of, what sorts of auditory and visual stimuli can you provide so that those expectations are met for the underlying structure? So the example I gave way back at the beginning of the course was you're playing uh, a Nintendo Wii game where you're shooting arrows through a bow and the user can hear that when they're further from the screen and they let the arrow fly, they hear the arrow leave the remote control and then they hear the arrow funk the target from the speakers in the screen, right? So in that hypothetical game, they're exploiting... Uh, they're exploiting auditory stimuli from both pieces of hardware to help you understand the structure of that ontology in that game, which is that the distance and orientation from the target matters. Okay, I'm going to show you a video now, which is an interesting use of, again, actually it is the Wiimote in this case, exploiting hardware and software and paying very careful attention to what people expect when they push against the physical world and observe the physical world pushing back. They help support that sensor motor loop that we all have to, to communicate the underlying structure of the information space you're going to see in this video. Okay. Hi. My name is Johnny Lee, and in this video, I'm going to show you how to perform head tracking and create desktop virtual reality displays using the Nintendo Wii Remote. Now, first, what do I mean by a desktop VR display? Well, when you think about most computer screens, they're typically used to display a flat image, a little bit like this picture in this picture frame. Even if the picture is of something 3D, uh, like a video game, the picture is still flat, so it doesn't change depending on what angle you view the screen at. A desktop VR display, however, is a little bit like taking the picture out of the picture frame and then just having the frame. Now the scene actually changes depending on what angle I view the screen at. So this essentially becomes a portal or a little window into another room. Now to do this, the computer needs to know the location of your head relative to the screen, and this is called head tracking. <coughs> now to perform head tracking, we're going to be using the Wii Remote and the sensor bar. But we're actually going to be using them backwards. We're going to put the Wii Remote next to the TV and actually move the sensor bar instead. The Wii Remote actually contains an infrared camera, and the sensor bar is simply two sources of infrared light. When the camera sees the two dots of light, it's going to give an approximate location of my head horizontally, vertically, and in distance from the screen. Okay, the tricky part is now we're going to have to find some way to mount the sensor bar onto our head. One common trick is to get a baseball cap and then mount the hardware to the cap. And this is definitely going to work, but it's a little bit goofy. So instead, some hardware stores sell these safety glasses with LEDs built in on the side meant to be used as headlamps. Now if you replace the LEDs with infrared ones, you essentially get your head mounted sensor bar and a nice sporty safety goggle form factor. Once we've created our head mounted sensor bar and I've connected my Wii Remote to my PC, we're, we're ready to do some head tracking. tracking. Behind me is a demo program of a 3D room with some targets floating in it. Now because the effect only works for the person wearing the sensor bar, I'm going to have to show you the effect through a moving camera. Now to do this, I'm literally just going to hold the sensor bar at the base of the camera and move it around. Just a quick note, to power the sensor bar, I simply turn on my Wii after I've connected my Wii remote to my PC. First. I'm going to show you what it looks like without head tracking, which is what displays normally look like. You can see that although it's a picture of a 3D room, the image looks very two-dimensional and bound to the surface of the TV. Now with head tracking turned on, the TV actually looks like the entrance to a real room. Just like in real life, by moving our head around, we can look behind objects. And if you look really closely, some targets actually appear to be floating out in front of the screen, reaching into the real world. 
If we get closer to the screen, we get closer to the objects, and we can even get behind the ones floating in front of the screen. As I pull the camera back, keep an eye on the frontmost target. Head tracking provides the illusion that the target is actually floating directly above the laptop screen far in front of the TV. Now using this picture of a football stadium, if you move right, you can see more of the field. If you move left, you can see more of the stands. And if you get closer to the screen, you see more of everything, just like a real window. If I use my IR glasses and keep the sensor bar on the TV, I can use a second Wii remote to point and shoot like any Wii game while also doing head tracking. So now ducking and shifting your body is actually meaningful to a game. You can also see now uh, how the perspective is incorrect if you are not the one wearing glasses. So head tracking for VR displays is only going to work for one person at a time. But for that one person, the 3D experience is going to be far more realistic and immersive than anything else we see in homes today. So if you're watching this and you're a Nintendo Wii game developer, I want to see some games. Anyway, as usual, you can visit my website to download this software and find out more information about my other Wiimote projects. Thanks for watching. Okay. So uh, at the end there, Johnny Lee was asking the Wii, uh, Wiimote developers to make some games. They were listening to him. They... Uh, bought his technology from him, and Johnny Lee doesn't have to work anymore. <laughs> so uh, there you go. Pay attention in this class. There's, uh, there's money to be made. Okay, so again, pretty simple information space. It's a three-dimensional space. There are these things in this space called targets, and these targets have a location in three-dimensional space, right? Even without the very fashionable glasses on, you got the idea, right? This is a three-dimensional space. But the moment he turned the technology on, hopefully you could see the difference, right? Your brain was telling you that you were looking at a three-dimensional space, even though you know you're not. You're looking at the surface of his TV screen. Why did your brain keep insisting that you were looking at a three-dimensional space? <clears throat> So this is the ultimate in an intuitive interface. The way it's set up is to support all of the expectations your brain has of moving in a three-dimensional space. What are those expectations? Like perceived distance? Perceived distance, right? But again, I don't perceive distance. My, my eyes perceive photons that fall on the surface of my retina. My brain infers distance from photons. How? What's the general interaction that's going on with the three-dimensional space that allows my brain to infer distance? <coughs> occlusion, right? So that's important. As I move, some things that were occluded become less occluded and others become more occluded. But you could do occlusion without the head tracking device, right? So you could watch the same video games, you could watch Johnny play it without wearing the things, and you would see targets being occluded by others, and you would know that that means the occluded <coughs> targets are further back in the three-dimensional space, but your brain would still be telling you that you're looking at a two-dimensional surface. So occlusion is important, but it's not the key here to make your brain, to trick your brain into thinking that you're looking at a three-dimensional space. The head tracking, right? So what it was tracking the position of the head, but not just tracking the absolute position of the head, but the position, three-dimensional position of the head relative to what? To the, screen. to the screen, right? Why? So that's an important part of, of creating this feedback loop. Yep. Depth perception. Depth perception, but again, how does your brain perceive depth? What is going on when it's looking at the screen? When your head is moving and you're looking at the screen, that casts the illusion of depth, where there is actually no depth. When you're farther away, it looks smaller and you see Okay, so when objects are further away, they tend to be smaller, which is true here, right? 
But again, you can do that without the glasses, right? So if you're not wearing the head-mounted device, you see that some objects become occluded, some are further away. It's not enough. Your brain is still telling you you're looking at a two-dimensional surface. What's the missing piece here? As you move your head around in three-dimensional space and your eyes are open, so you're seeing the objects around you, what happens to those objects? Yes, some of them become occluded. Objects that are further away tend to be smaller than objects that are closer. What else happens? Well, without the, without the head tracking, yep. they're all, um, they'll stay in the same place as if they're all on that screen. They all stay in the same place, um, yes. With the head tracking, it, um, it changes their location. So uh, they, <laughs> they're still uh, they're like perpendicular to the screen, rather. OK, we're getting, cl we're getting closer now. Yeah, you're getting closer. That's right. So they move, right? The objects in the game move. How do they move? So now we're not talking about occlusion or size. We're talking about the movement of the targets, right? We're getting closer now. Well, so they move as you expect them to. Like, ah. stand up and walk towards you, I expect them to get bigger. Absolutely. Like, you do that with your head, then you expect them to get bigger than you do. Absolutely. The moment I move, or the, move, or the moment my head moves, my brain expects to see all of your faces move. My brain knows a fair bit about the physical world. The brain assumes you're not all trying to trick me and you're not all moving at once. It's probably me that's moving. So when I move to the right, and I can feel, based on my sensory systems, that I'm moving to the right, all of you seem to flow to the left. If I were to walk towards you, your faces would become larger. Some of you are further from me than others. So what happens when I move to the right? What happens to all of your heads from my field of view? They all move to the left. Can we be a little bit more specific than that? <coughs> the people further away move left at a lesser rate and closer. There it is. That's the key, right? So the Wii mode, uh, the head tracking detects how my head is moving relative to the screen and it computes specific movement trajectories for all the objects. Objects that are supposed to be further away move to the left less than objects that are closer to me, right? So if you took all those objects and moved them to the left at the same amount, you, the illusion would collapse and you'd be looking at a flat screen again, right? The fact that all the objects were moving at different velocities when Johnny moved his head instantly convinced your brain that it was looking at a three-dimensional space, right? If you draw a bunch of heads on a piece of paper and move your head relative to the piece of paper, it looks like a piece of paper because the heads that are drawn on it aren't moving, right? Now when you're in software, those kinds of opportunities are, are freed up and it, you can cast the illusion that you're looking at a three-dimensional scene without wearing those 3D glasses. Okay, so Johnny, was take, Johnny Lee was taking account of this very specific expectation that our brain has when we move or we push against the world, in this case figuratively, and we observe how the world pushes back figuratively. I move to the right, all the heads move to the left, and the heads at the back move to the left less than the ones at the front. If you can support that illusion, your brain cannot come to any other conclusion except that it's looking at a field of objects embedded in a three-dimensional space. Okay, last question about this video. Hopefully it looked three-dimensional to you. Did it? You weren't wearing the IR emitters. He just finished telling you that this only works for one person who's wearing the glasses. You weren't wearing the glasses, but it looks 3D. How did that happen? To be able to sync the movement rotation of the camera with the virtual camera. Exactly. In the so your brain was actually being tricked by two illusions. There's the one we just talked about. And then when a camera moves, so when you're watching a video in first person, <coughs> meaning the camera is sort of from his point of view, your brain is putting itself into Johnny's shoes, right? So you feel as if you are the one who's moving around. So 
In that case, when he held the camera on top of the Wii bar and moved it around, it cast that illusion that you were inside the camera, right, looking out of the, the camera. If you go back and watch the video, you actually watch him at the end where he's wearing the thing and he's jumping around and he's playing the game and it doesn't look three-dimensional. It might look a little bit three-dimensional, but not as much as when he, he was moving the camera because your brain is now watching Johnny. You're not in Johnny's frame of, you're not watching the scene from Johnny's frame of, of reference. Make sense? Okay, so again, when this is done right, if you exploit software and hardware in the right way to support what your brain expects, your brain is in a head which is moving about in a three-dimensional space, you can create the most intuitive of user interfaces which not only do you not need a tutorial or any written text whatsoever, it happens immediately because your brain can't tell the difference between movement in three-dimensional space and movement through a virtual three-dimensional space. Okay. This is one of the best examples in this whole course of bringing together people and technology. Thinking now not just about people's anatomical differences, but thinking about the actual cognitive mechanisms going on in the head, the expectations that brains make as they move about through the physical world. Okay. All right, so that's exploiting media, hardware, and software. We're talking about ontologies here. We've talked about design already. So helping people think about the structure of this space, we want to try and give it some sort of coherent design, right? Maybe cl places that are close to one another in an information space look similar, or have the same sort of color. Um, we might use standard templates, something to sort of make whatever you're, the structure you're trying to uh, display consistent, right? So in Gapminder, bigger circles meant larger populations. It would be very confusing if you went to a different visualization inside Gapminder, and smaller circles meant more of something, right? So the, the, there's a consistent uh, visual metaphor in Gapminder across all the visualizations that Gapminder provides. Okay. In most complicated information spaces, you, the user, may not be the only person moving through that space. There may be other users moving through that space, and there may be other agents, or what are now called bots, I guess, that are also moving through this space. And we're going to define an agent or a bot, if you like, as a little piece of code that also has perceptual and motor capabilities. So the bot is also able to see the information space and manipulate it or move through it. It might see the space differently from how you see it, and it may move through the space differently from how the user moves through it, but it is like you able to perceive and uh, move. So how could we create bots that do some work in this, in this uh, information space to help make the structure a little bit more uh, obvious? One common technique that's used in a lot of bots is a trick that's borrowed from Mother Nature. So a lot of social insects, especially ants, uh, as they move around, they drop a chemical signal in their environment called uh, pheromones. And they use that to build up an understanding of their space and communicate the structure of that space to their fellow ants. So um, pheromones are actually quite complicated, but the basic idea is very intuitive. You're an ant that lives in the colony uh, here. Uh, you live in a vast featureless desert, so there's not a lot of landmarks. It's kind of hard to find your way around. You get up in the morning, you leave the nest, and you wander around at random. And if you're lucky, you find a food source. And as you are moving around randomly, you're leaving pheromone as you move. So once you collect some food, you turn around continue dropping pheromone, and follow the pheromone gradient back to the nest. That's all you do. Follow pheromone. If there's no pheromone, walk randomly. If there is pheromone, um, follow the pheromone gradient. If you have a whole bunch of ants that are doing this, they're all coming out of this, uh, out of this nest, and there's a bunch of food sources around here, eventually bun a bunch of paths will start to appear between the various food sources and the nest. But most importantly, the shortest paths to the closest food sources will become much stronger 
the smell of pheromone will be stronger along those paths than it is on the paths to distant food sources. How is that possible? I told you what the ants do. How is it that paths to shorter, uh, to closer food sources become more reinforced than ones that are further away? What's going on here? Yes? Like, I guess um, the more ants that go down, the more pheromones um, that get put down, so these the kinds of environments the more popular ones that you find? Absolutely, right? So the more ants that are traveling a path, and they're laying in pheromone as they go, that path is going to get more pheromone. But why are there more ants on the paths connecting to the closer food sources? The ants aren't trying, they don't do any navigation. They have no GPS to say, okay, I'm at this food source. This one is closer to the nest. So as I walk back, I'm going to emit more pheromone than from a distant food source. They're not, as far as we know, most ant species aren't that smart. Well, they're, once they have the food turning around and then leaving another trail, take a lot quicker for that trail to be you know, already back in the colony. So other ants, like instead of one that they travels a really long way to get the food, it'll take longer for them to get back. Absolutely. So imagine we have two ants, and at a point in time, one ant is at food source A, and the other ant is at food source B, and A is closer to the nest than B. Both ants do the same thing. They start walking back towards the nest, and as they go, they drop pheromone. The one that's at A is going to get back to the nest before the one that gets back to B. It's going to turn around, or other ants are going to leave the nest. What are they going to do? They're going to follow A. There isn't even a path B yet. And even if there is, it's going to take longer for it to appear. Right. So just because of the fact that those paths happen to be shorter, they get reinforced more by ants traveling along them. And like a magic trick, Without ants being able to compute distances, collectively they're able to construct shortest paths between, uh, between points. Right? Once the snow starts to fall here as well, we're going to see an example of 12,000 humans doing pretty much exactly the, the same thing. Right? But instead of pheromones, it's footfalls in the, in the snow. Okay, so with that very simple trick, if you have an information space that is a network or a graph made up of nodes and edges, and you want to try and paint or construct shortest paths, you could go in and write a very complex uh, computer science algorithm to compute them all, calculate them, and put them in a visualization for your users, or write six lines of Python code for a bot that does pretty much what I just described for the ants, let a thousand of those bots loose in your information space, and they will do this. British Telecom in the UK actually uses this technique for their, um, for their telecommunications. So you have uh, a network structure, and you've got packets traveling along it. So you have a fixed network structure. But it's dynamic in the sense that certain paths get clogged by packets. So you want to continuously compute what is the shortest path between computer A and computer B. This is a pretty simple way to do it, and British Telecom has been using this technique for, for quite a while to do so. OK. OK, uh, just one last example here. I showed you this visualization last time from the online course that we run, Ludobots. Uh, we tried to take the same thing into account in a much simpler way. So instead of, having, instead of having virtual bots that are doing this, whenever a user posts a submission to any of the programming projects, we just draw a dot to the screen, right? So you can sort of see at a glance where most students have gone, or at least where most successful students have gone. Maybe lots of students have traveled this path, but they either didn't post their submissions or they couldn't finish the submissions or what have you, right? So trying to exploit, in this case, the, the overall community, user community to help advertise the underlying structure of this information space. What is the most well-traveled path? What are the easier assignments than, than others? OK. Oops. 
Okay, so uh, we've talked about information spaces. Let's move on to navigation of information spaces. Again, when you're thinking about how to help your users navigate through the space, your users have decades of experience with navigating physical spaces. What can we? What what expectations do they have of navigating an unfamiliar physical space that you can draw on to help them navigate an unfamiliar virtual space? Well, usually when you're starting to understand a new space, you you enter into a number of specific navigation activities. The first one of usually which is what's here, right? Object <coughs> identification. What, it, what exists at the local spot that I'm at? And then exploration, right? I'm here, where can I go from here? There's two doors that I can see out of here. Do they give on to the same hallway or different hallways? Once I start to move through this space, then I start to do much more, much less of object identification and exploration and much more of wayfinding. I'm in this room, I want to get back to my office within 10 minutes after class. I can think in my head about what the shortest path is to get there because I have quite a bit of experience now with the physical topology between here and my office. What other navigation activities do you see users conducting when they're moving through an unfamiliar space. So you're playing a new video game, you're on a new website, you're trying to figure out the structure, you're trying to figure out where you are, where you need to get to, what else? What else do you do to try and learn about that space and how you can move through it? Just try going through random you know, blocks or random you know, links. Okay. And then going back to where you were to see you know, where they go and how they relate. Absolutely. So maybe you just explore a little bit. You want to see whether you can reverse direction. Can I go back to the start? Or do I have to click reset to teleport back to wherever I was before? Can I repeat that path? So is the topology of the space changing over time? If I know how to get from A to B, Today, and I come back tomorrow, can I follow the same path from A to B, or has the underlying path changed? For the internet, the answer is yes, the paths do change over time, right? The old path may no longer exist and be replaced with a new path. What other kinds of navigation activities might you enter into when learning about a new space, virtual or physical? Absolutely, right? So I go from A to B and I turn around, whatever that means in the space. Does the space support turn around and can I see where I came from, right? Does that, is that supported in this, in this space? Okay, can list a whole bunch of, of other things. What about the size of the space? So if I, try, if I start at A and I explore and instead of going on a random walk, I try and go in the same direction, <coughs> do I come to an edge? Is there an edge to the space? Do I wrap around and end up where I, where I started? How big is this space? Right. So search has kind of been perfected now. Within most spaces, there's a search bar. and You can teleport to any arbitrary place in the space. So maybe you don't need to know the structure. But assuming you do, usually, maybe unbeknownst to you, you're conducting a lot of these navigation strategies. How many ways are there to get from A to B? Is there only one path or are there multiple paths? What's the most frequented neighborhood, right? So what's the social side of this space? Am I the only one moving through this space? Has there been someone at point A where I am right now? Is there someone else here now? Has there been someone else here in the past? Is this place more frequently visited than, than that one? Has anyone played any Wikipedia games? Wikipedia is pretty big, right? You know the underlying structure. It's a network. There's nodes which correspond to pages and links that connect nodes together. Is there structure to the Wikipedia space? Anyone can create pages and connect them together, right? There's no top-down control saying the space has to be hierarchical or organized in this way. Does it have structure? 
it, it's, it, it's relational, right? So on any page, there are links that relate to other pages. But imagine that we were to try and draw that space, right? I think on the previous lecture, I had a picture, picture of the internet circa 2004, right? It's this huge network of nodes and edges. Looks like a tangle of spaghetti. What about Wikipedia? Is it a random tangle of spaghetti? If you play some of these Wikipedia games, and here's just one page that I found that has a list of them, there is definitely structure to the Wikipedia universe. I was going to say, uh, they're often connected to broader topics. They connect to broader topics. So yep. eventually, you can keep going out broad, and then you can go back down specific if you want to connect <coughs> to ideas. Absolutely, so right? As it naturally builds its own yes. relationship over time. You take a random page, and it says, here is this topic, and this topic is an instance of this more abstract concept, which takes you up to a more abstract level assuming there are levels, right? Or this concept is embodied in these more specific examples which take you down into more detail, right? So that suggests there's kind of a direct, at least one dimension of direction that you can travel in Wikipedia, which is more abstract or more concrete, right? Again, no top-down control of that. There's a specific Wikipedia game where you start on a random page and you start reading the text and you click on the very first link that you see that's in the main text, not any headers or anything like that. It takes you to a new page, you click on the first link in the main text of that page, and so on and so forth. What do you think happens if you do that? Does it take you back around, right? What is, it, what is the structure here? Do you just keep moving uh, around and around? The answer is no. You end up in a very specific place. Isn't it like modern philosophy? Philosophy. It, at least it used to. You can play this game and see, but typically you will end up with philosophy. The Wikipedia founders did not say, make sure that your first link is more abstract than the main body of the text itself. It's just something that emerged from a whole bunch of people building Wikipedia, right? So if you start to play these games, like the philosophy game, you start to realize that there is underlying structure in the space which you can't directly see, right? And even if you do look at a visualization of Wikipedia, it doesn't look like, it's hard to see the structure in a direct visualization. Okay. Um, I've got a, a, a worked example here that we're going to skip over. You can sort of do this as homework if you like. This is a, a, a summary of the Netflix, Netflix prize data. So this was a bunch of years ago now um, where you could submit your uh, machine learning algorithm. And if it did better at predicting people's ratings of movies, if you did significantly better than Netflix current state-of-the-art algorithm, you won a million dollars. Um, obviously, it's worth a lot more than a million to, to Netflix. Um, so you can take this data set that I describe here and sort of do some of this navigation through the space. So the team that ended up winning the million dollars, they did a lot of this analytics up front, right? What is kind of the structure, if any, that's hidden inside this data set? And once you start to understand a little bit of the structure, it suggests how to apply machine learning algorithms to it. Okay, it's there for you to play around with if you, if you like, but it's just optional. Okay, so uh, again, some other specific uh, navigation behaviors that you see people doing when they're moving through a new virtual space. Landmark knowledge, right? So I'm moving around and I see something that's familiar. Okay, I may not know where I am, but I know I've been <coughs> over, over there, right? What counts as a landmark in a virtual space? Any examples? If there's a magnifying glass, you can search there. Okay, so the magnifying glass basically says from here you can get to anywhere else if you know what to query. What else? You're, mo you're moving through a physical space, you're a little bit lost, you see something off in the distance that's kind of familiar, you say, okay, I know where I'm going, if I head over there, I'll be in more familiar territory. What's a virtual analog of that behavior? Like the home icon? Sorry? The home icon. The home icon, okay, that's right. So there I can teleport back to somewhere I know that's, that's familiar, absolutely. 
I'm playing the Wikipedia game and I end up on a page I've never been on before, but I see that there's a link that's purple instead of blue, right? Or a link that I recognize. Oh, if I click there, I, I, I may not even have been on that page that I'm going to end up on, but it's closer to where I've been before, right? All those sorts of things which are, again, meeting our expectation about moving through physical uh, spaces. Same sort of thing, root knowledge, right? I see a landmark or I see a familiar road or a path. I know if I get on that path, it will eventually take me back to somewhere uh, familiar. Survey knowledge. Once you have enough understanding of the structure of a space, you can sort of close your eyes, imagine yourself at an arbitrary point in space, and imagine another arbitrary point in that space and mentally simulate what's the best way to get from point A to point B. Most of you are juniors or seniors. You can probably play this game with the UVM campus, right? You close your eyes. You think about two points on campus. You could probably mentally simulate how to get from point A to point B in the most efficient manner, right? Okay. How do you do that? Well, again, you form a mental model of that space, which is what we're going to start talking about in a moment in Lecture 11. What is a mental model? Well, as the name implies, it's a model. It's not the real thing. It's some approximation of the actual physical campus that you can think about and manipulate mentally. If you know what it looks like from different vantage points, that means not only do you have a mental model of the UVM campus, but you can manipulate it. You can rotate it and think about looking at the Vodi building from the north, from the east, from the west, from the, the south. Right? You may not apply all of these ideas to a virtual space, but often that is what you're, you're doing, even though you don't realize that's what you're, you're doing. Assuming that you want, you're, you're creating a new information space for your users, like your ASL educational game, what sorts of visualizations are you going to create that allow your users to keep from getting lost in your system? If they're at a point in your game and they're not sure what they're supposed to be doing, can they turn around and go back the way they came? Is there something like the home icon that they can click on or gesture to take themselves back to a familiar point in your, your game? Are they able to see at a glance how far they've come and how far left they have to go to complete all the lessons in your, your system? What kinds of things are you going to show to the, your users to help them understand the underlying structure of your system and help them navigate through it? Okay. I think we're going to skip over this as well. Moving through an information space versus a physical space. How is it easier or more difficult? I think uh, I'll leave that one for now. Uh, signage. We've kind of already talked about this. Signage and labels. Again, what are the sorts of pointers you might put in the space to help users uh, move around? What might be a sign you're going to add to your Leap Motion interface to help people navigate? And again, no text, so it can't be a sign saying this way for lesson three. What sorts of visualizations might stand in for a sign in your Leap Motion game? If they sign something correctly, they have a green check mark or something like that. A green check mark, which usually means in a moment you're going to be moving forward right. to something else. That's it. Makes sense, right? A green check mark, you've done well, and it's implied you're now going to go on to something else, right? What other signs might you employ in your system? Um, maybe if you, you're setting up to complete a number of, you know, a number of signs, then you could have a little start to have it fill as you complete the number so it shows your progress. Okay, so a progress bar or a wheel or something that's showing your progress so you get a feel that you're moving through this, you this space. Right, you can gauge how far you've, you've come, right? Maybe at some point in the game I get to choose which digits I want to sign or which sequence. I want to practice sequences. I want to do 3-1, 3-1, 3-1, 8-6-2, 8-6-2, 8-6-2. I get to choose. I can either go this way to practice individual digits, or I can go this way to practice sequencing. Right? 
How might you show your users that they have a choice at this point? They've reached some level of competency where now these options open up. How might you advertise that in a sign? <coughs> You could get video to work. You could have, like, you could still put like an arrow, but you have one that's just a, uh, just one digit, and one where the digits going back and forth. Absolutely right. So I could see a short video or short animation saying, "Oh, I get it." That way is singles, and that way is is doubles. I could have arrows, right? That's a pretty common thing to do. It's a pretty common sign. But think about this specific application, right? So if there's a saw, if I see two arrows, I still need to figure out how do I go down either path. You can move your hand to one of the sides and then sign something. Absolutely. So maybe there's a sign turning to the, there's an arrow pointing to the left over here and a sign pointing to the right over here. So with my secondary hand, I float it to the right or float it to the left and I'm indicating which direction I want to go, right? That would be a pretty easy thing to, to do. Or instead of arrows, there's an icon saying this or this, right? So I know that I need to point in which direction I want to go next, right? What sorts of signage that doesn't require writing text to the screen helps your users understand how to navigate through the, the space. <coughs> okay, we already mentioned social navigation, so having your users leave markers in the environment so that the next user who comes along gets an idea for places to go, popular places, difficult places, easy places, uh, and so on. And back to the pheromones, which we already talked about. Okay, sorry, I raced through that a little bit. We got two minutes left, so I will just introduce the next theme of the course. We've spent a lot of time talking about interfaces and people. Now we're going to focus on a particular aspect of people, which is the brain and cognition. Right? In neuroscience, uh, all of the evidence that seems to be uh, coming out of neuroscience suggests that the brain is a prediction machine. For those of you that know about deep learning, that's what deep learning is doing. It's predicting what's in an image when it sees a whole image or part of an image. Why is the brain a prediction machine? Because in order to survive and prosper in the world, I need to think about performing a candidate action maybe a dangerous action, and be able to predict what is the sensory result of that action. If I were to reach with my hand towards my bag, my brain is making a prediction that it's going, I'm going to see my hand approach the bag. If I mentally simulate getting up on the desk here and balancing on uh, my left foot, my brain is making a prediction about what might happen, which is possibly something uh, dangerous, right? So our brains evolved to be prediction machines and your brain does not turn off its prediction abilities when it's looking at a computer screen. When you click on an icon or you see an ASL game that has these two icons on the screen and you do this, your brain has already made a prediction about what it expects to see or hear in the next tenth of a second, one second, two seconds. So I want you to keep that in mind as we work our way through these four lectures on cognitive psychology. At root, your brain is a prediction machine, and we are writing hardware and software to try and support those expectations and those predictions. As we go through lecture 11 through 14, we're going to start with the most uh, objective aspect of our psychology, which is creating these mental models. The mental model is the thing that allows your brain to make the prediction. That's, that's pretty objective and pretty straightforward. As we go, we're going to move through some other aspects of cognition that are increasingly, increasingly subjective, meaning there isn't hard neuroscience fact to back these things up, but it seems to be what we do. When we get to 14, we're going to talk about affect, which is the psychology fancy word for emotion. Right? So can technology detect your emotion? Can your technology project the illusion that it has emotion? And why the heck would you ever want to create a device that does that? OK, I think we'll leave things there for today. You have a quiz tonight. We'll start on lecture 11 on Wednesday. <laughs>